but this is our go devil that we use for duck hunting and this is the swamp that we duck hunt in and this is our boat shed i want to say that boat shed was built somewhere around the 20 or 2011 somewhere in there see that dock the water is right up at, underneath that dock uh right now the water is a little bit higher than what we like it but there's so much water fluctuation in here that we just kind of got used to it we've had the water so high that we cannot get the boat underneath that roof and we've had the water so low that we can't even use that and right now it's about five six foot deep underneath there and we've had the water down to where the water starts right here on the very edge of this boat shed so this swamp is used as a water reservoir for crawfish farmers they levy it up around it so we have nearly 10 feet of water fluctuation um, but let, let's go ahead and get fishing we're gonna go out here today and sockeye fish there's some really big black crappie in here so usually with this go devil we have a driver and a push pole man you can see right here we have a two by two there and a two by two right there and they both have hooks on them and they will usually have a guy sitting on that tote pushing off of trees that way we kind of pinball our way through um, but with the boat being so light without people and equipment i should be able to control it by myself let's see So this here is our front duck blind. You can see our mojo poles here. There's a bu some buzzards trying to make a, a nest in there. But uh, you can see there's a, a left side and a right side. This left side was a two or three man duck blind that was here already, but it's fallen apart. So we built this four man on the side. It's 16 foot long and I wanna say four feet deep. We built that ladder this past season and we've been having to add these uh, metal legs to it because these trees all rotted out. But it's rock solid now with all those new legs. These sockele are up here in these trees if you can find clear water. Out here is about 12 foot deep. Underneath those trees are between five and eight foot deep and we found that that's the sweet spot. What I'm gonna do is before we get up in there, I'm gonna set up my pole. 
you don't need much for Sakale. There's about a million colors and all kinds of different setups to go fishing. Oh look, I've got mine set up. Boy, you can hear all those black belly whistling ducks, or as we call them, Mexican squealers. I don't know if my phone's gonna pick it up that good, but you see all that? That's all squealers. They started nesting in here a few years ago. I don't think that they go all the way home to Florida like they usually did. Look, they might, they might pass us over. There's a few, but yeah, really cool to see. Anyway, today we're gonna be using Bobby Garland Mayfly. And uh, the color is called Monkey Milk. In here, the water's so clear. I'll show you guys. So the water, it's a little dirty right now, but if you look at it, it's clear, 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 clear and black. You can see about four or five feet down if the sun's good. But up in there, uh, along these cypress trees, that's where we were catching these sockelet for the past few weeks. Really good size. I hope I can get some on camera today. But, so this monkey milk color, I think is just enough to show up in that clear water. So I, I think when you go with too aggressive of a color and the clear water, it kind of psychs them out a little bit. So this one's used up. It's not really staying on the hook. So I'm gonna go ahead and use some of these. They make this shape in a few different colors. Um, I found them at Academy. They have them in this little baby wipe pouch for like 10 bucks and it's 50 of them. So. If you find this color works good, you don't have to buy 10 packs of these things. You know, you can just buy one pack of 50 and you'll be okay. I've also used these in Henderson along the railroad tracks. That worked good. You see, I don't know if you guys can see everything I'm doing. It might be facing in the middle of nothing, but there we go. All right. And this is a K Fred jig pole. Um, my original is right there. That's not K Fred. That was a two piece fly rod kit in a blister pack that they used to sell at Academy. But they do not sell them anymore. So K Fred found the company that made those fly rods and he got his own, made his own. So it's an eight and a half foot medium light action rod and i just put these little trigger spin reels on there i find that's the most streamlined setup you can get k fred uses a uh just a little egg beater you know spin cast and he loves it i've never used it but it just kind of seems like it would get tangled more i don't know but i like these little trigger reels so we're gonna go about about three to four foot deep. And we'll make sure that this knot is positioned on top of the eye of that hook. That way we sit sideways in there. But uh, I had a B&M fly rod, uh, socolay rod before, and it was a 10 footer, but it was so doggone whippy and flimsy that I would miss fish left and right. Man, I couldn't set the hook to save my life. Now, I mean, obviously it's made for that purpose, so I know people use them, but I'm just not a huge fan of them. But some people swear by them at work. Those nice long rods to really get to jigging. Like right now it'd be useful, but I don't know. I'm not really a professional soccer fisherman by any stretch of the imagination. I just started learning how to soccer fish this year. So I'm still new to it. I used to just bass fish and brim fish and that was it. But a uh, soccer is kind of a good mixture of the two. Let's see. And you just pop that cork. And I find in here a lot of times 
the sockele commit pretty quickly. It's not, it hasn't been something to where you have to sit there and jig for five minutes at a time per spot. Usually, if I drop it, if I don't get something within the first 20 seconds or so, I move to the different spot. I'm sure I'm missing fish using that method, but I don't know. I'm ADD. I can't sit there for too, too long. All right. Now, I'm going to try to adjust this down a little bit. Maybe you can see what I see. All right. Well, I, as soon as I turned off the camera, as luck would have it, I missed the fish. But either way, it would have been something good for you guys to see. I missed him right there in those three cypress trees, right in the middle. But something I've kind of learned about Sakale this season is that once you miss them, that's it. Uh, in here, at least. They, they don't really make the same mistake twice i've never missed one recasted right there and caught them again um i, I mean i'm hard-headed i'm gonna try it anyway right but i've never had luck doing it so it was about right there where i missed them the first time now i mean fish don't really live by a set rule you know so if you got one that's dumb enough he might hit it again but in my experience, it has not happened. See how I'm doing right there? It's like kind of jigging, but it's more casting than anything. Let's see. I'll turn the camera back on because there's got to be a fish right there. Got to be. We've all said that before, right? stick come on this is textbook right here all right guys there's my first black sockele they're not as dark as they were the past few weeks and uh, this is rather small for in here they're usually a little bigger than that, um, but nevertheless, he will eat. And that's off of that monkey milk color. And this is the kind of stuff we're fishing, or I'm fishing anyway. Caught him right over there. And that right where this duckweed ends and gets to clear water, that's where he was at. Come on, right there. Oh. Cork did something a little funky right there. I don't know if that was just my bait getting to the bottom finally, or I don't, or a fish. Let's give that another try. If it was a socket, it probably won't bite again. That's how it's been. I might end up getting a GoPro and attaching a weight to it and dropping it down in there just to see what's under there you know that's, i think that'd be really cool to see might have to get a waterproof flashlight down there with it but i think it'd be awesome to see what's going on under there or maybe one of those ice fishing cameras i've seen those oh there he is sweet another little average size one I don't want to swing it in the boat because I don't know if this string would pop or not there you go and he hit it while I was popping it too not a bad fish
while I've been fishing, I noticed that there's an egg on that log. I think that's a duck egg, it's probably a wood duck. Never seen that happen, but that's pretty cool. Hey there, my Louisiana woodsman. So this is the catch from the duck hunting camp. Uh, this is the swamp that we duck hunt out of. And we got a few really nice slabs here. You can see those, those are real thick, nice and fat. I think it's a bunch of males from what I've been told because none of them have eggs. Uh, all the ones I've caught are kind of skinny in the stomach. So that makes me think that these are males. Let's see. Got a tape measure. Uh, Friday, I caught 17, threw back a few because they were kind of small. This is my smallest. Let's see, and for reference, that is about 10 inches, a little bit over. And this one, a little bit bigger, there, about 12 inches. And then we got a few of these ones that are a little bigger. No, stand corrected, 12 inches. Uh, almost 13, 12 and a half. So on average between 10 and 12 inch socolate come out of there. They're a really good size. Um, I'm gonna show you guys how I fillet these fish. Uh, I fillet almost all of my fish the same. I'm not an expert by any means, but I feel like this is a good technique let me stack these to the side so first thing i do i come behind that front fin and i cut on that head at an angle on both sides then i take it and i face his back toward me and I take my knife, get down to that backbone, and then I start walking along that backbone until I get about halfway down. I feel like I passed up the rib cage and I go all the way through. And I make sure my knife is pinned against that backbone and I go all the way to the tail, cut it off. And then I open it up like this so I could see inside and I cut along that rib cage. And then at this point, you could peel most of it away. About like that. And then I cut off the skin and that's what I'm left with. Now from there, I grab a little chunk of meat right here with my fingers and I get down with my knife. I just cut in straight and then I go in at an angle and basically scrape that meat off of the bone, not off of the scales, just like that. And now I'm left with a bunch of meat and then I feel with my fingers, see if there's any bones in there. I don't want any surprises for my family or me when I'm eating. So it looks like it's wasteful, but it's not. I cut that off and there you go. You're left with a filet with no bones.